Um, the Selma Jean Cohen Fund for International Scholarship on Dance honors the pioneering and seminal contributions of preeminent dance historian Selma Jean Cohen. The fund was created in 2000 and it recognizes the importance of her exchange experience in Russia on a Fulbright. And to perpetuate her interests in dance as an international enterprise, all Cohen dance lectures are presented at the annual conference. So this year's awardee is Tria Blue Wakpa. She is an assistant professor of dance studies at the Department of World Arts and Cultures and Dance at the University of California, Los Angeles. She received a PhD and MA from the Department of Ethics, Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, and an MFA in Creative Writing from San Diego State University. She has a BA in English with an option in Film from Oklahoma State University. Her research and teaching centers on community-engaged, decolonializing, and dance study methodologies to examine the politics and practices of dance and other movement forms such as theatrical productions, athletics, and yoga for indigenous peoples in and beyond structures and institutions of confinement. Please welcome today's 2023 Selma Jean Cohen Dance Lecture awardee, Tria Blue Wakpa. Thank you. My heart is happy to be here with you today on the lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples in what is often referred to as Denver, Colorado. Lakota, Ute, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, Shoshone, and other tribal nations also have historical and enduring relationships with this land. In the 1950s and 60s, Denver was one of the urban relocation sites, or US cities designated by the federal government to relocate native people from reservations and attempt to assimilate them. Yet native people have long resisted assimilation and innovated their practices. This is evident at the Denver March powwow a three-day gathering featuring native dance, which has been held every March since 1984. For the instrumental support that made this lecture possible, I'm a, I am grateful to Alicia Munir, the Selma Jean Cohen Fund, Selma Jean Cohen herself, who as we heard was an esteemed dance historian, writer, and educator, and of course the Fulbright Association. In 2012, 2013, I had the honor and privilege of being a Fulbright Scholar to the Philippines, the country in which my mother was born and my grandmother was born and raised. And that's on the left is my grandmother and her grandmother, who she was very close to, my mother in Manila in the middle, and those are my two daughters, Hante and Azilia, on the right. For my Fulbright project, I wrote a series of poems which creatively explored the experiences of Filipino and Native children under U.S. colonization in the Philippines and U.S. My father has Native ancestry and is of Powhatan descent, so this project was a way for me to consider and connect the experiences of my ancestors on both sides of my family. This life-changing experience also helped to clarify for me the connections among indigenous peoples' worldviews and experiences beyond national borders. Many people do not realize that Native American tribes are nations, so the exchange of indigenous dances between tribes constitutes a form of international exchange even within U.S. borders. Although indigenous peoples have diverse cultures, they also often share similar understandings of the necessity of nurturing respectful and reciprocal human and more than human relationships and holistic understandings of the mind, body, and spirit. 
By more than human, I mean non-human animals, air, water, land, and the cosmos. Indigenous peoples internationally have also experienced ongoing colonization and struggle to protect their land, lifeways, and futurity. Building on these understandings but shifting sites, this presentation describes some of the decolonial possibilities of Native American dance. That is, it delineates international commonalities among what indigenous dance is and does within U.S. borders. Dance and indigenous studies have often overlooked the meanings and possibilities of indigenous dance and the in inextricable connections between native dances and lands. Native dance takes place on and off stage and can be incredibly diverse given commonalities in native ways of knowing and moving. The Eurocentric frameworks of anthropocentrism and Cartesian dualism attempt to portray humans as separate from and superior to more than humans and the mind as separate from and superior to the body. Yet indigenous understandings recognize that humans and more than humans are interconnected, knowledgeable, and sacred. Indigenous dances which are inextricable from native understandings can challenge logics of anthropocentrism and Cartesian dualism by honoring firstly more than human relatives and second bodies and bodily movements as vital sources of knowledge. In this way, native dance can be viewed as a long-standing and dynamic decolonial practice. In this presentation, I first define how the term Native American is being used, and then outline seven interconnected decolonial possibilities of Native dance. I selected the number seven because it is a well-recognized number in tribally specific and pan-Indigenous understandings, which connotes Native communities, futurities, and more than human interconnections. This presentation positions returning land to indigenous people, what native academics and activists frequently refer to as land back, as a powerful practice that can support indigenous people in revitalizing and innovative, innovating their dances. I will conclude my lecture today by offering a brief workshop on North American hand talk. The original lingua franca, or common language, of uh, North America utilized by indigenous peoples from diverse nations to communicate with one another. As I will show, no Native people have employed North American hand talk in their dances as a decolonial tactic to communicate with audiences in the present and future. Finally, I will allow some time at the end of this lecture for a Q&A and encourage your questions, comments, and feedback. Considering the immense variety among Native dances, it is nearly an impossible task to create a comprehensive definition or description of Native dancing. These dances are practiced by people from hundreds of tribes and take place in diverse settings, including concert halls, outdoors, and other community settings. Although indigenous peoples and dances exist throughout the world, this presentation focuses on international Native American dances within U.S. borders. The politics of indigeneity and what constitutes an indigenous person are multifaceted, contested, and vary. However, in the U.S., a primary determinant of Native identity is an individual having citizenship in a federally recognized or at times state recognized native nation. That is, native people are often dual citizens of the US and their indigenous nation, which differentiates them from all immigrant groups and demonstrates that indigenous identity is a political category rather than a racial one. Currently, in the US, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. However, this number is subject to change as more Native na nations petition for federal recognition or conversely are unjustly stripped of their sovereignty. 
Within this variety of settings, Native American dancing presents a similar array of characteristics and purposes. Indigenous dances can be tribally specific or intra-tribal or pan-tribal, inter-tribal. Some dances have tribally specific origins, but have developed to become pan-tribal. Native people and experts will make a distinction between native ceremonial dances versus native social dances, with the implication that social dances are secular. Ceremonial dances may occur in intertribal and intertribal contexts. Due to differences between indigenous and mainstream understandings of dancing, it is crucial to use a culturally relevant and or tribally specific lens to analyze native dances and other practices. Colonization continues to impact the frameworks used to study native dancing, seen most vividly in native logics and gender norms which can complicate the male-female binary that is prevalent in Eurocentric constructions. In some native dances, like the cross dance or switch dance, practitioners switch to a different gender. Women will dance a style that is associated with men or vice versa. A cross dance or switch dance can be a way of honoring people of that gender. A cross or switch dance can also provide an opportunity for people who are two-spirit or non-binary to dance a form consistent with and celebratory of their gender beyond the binaries of female and male. Centering Native Dance also highlights the importance of attending to how social structures frequently misrepresent Indigenous people and practices as deviant, criminal, static, and or extinct. A prevalent and false stereotype about traditional native dances is that they cannot be choreographed in the contemporary day. A dance studies approach demonstrates that no dance can be perfectly replicated. And thus all dances, including traditional dances, can be innovated because dances change each time they are performed. Native people have also indigenized movement mo modes such as pole dancing, burlesque, hip hop, skateboarding, and yoga. Further evidencing how settler colonial structures have mischaracterized Native peoples and practices and, as deviant and criminal from the late 1800s to the 1978 American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the US government outlawed some Native dances. One of the reasons why the US government banned native dancing is because of the fear of dancing's power and transform transformative capabilities. Even during this prohibition, indigenous people continued to covertly practice in their community, taking their dances underground. Today, indigenous artists and practitioners choreograph new traditional dances. In recent decades, cell phones with audiovisual capabilities and social media platforms have circulated native dancing and brought attention to these practices. Indigenous dances have been performed in shopping malls, on the front lines of social protests, and for healing and solidarity. To show the multifaceted purposes of indigenous dance, I will now describe seven decolonial possibilities of native dance. First and foremost, many indigenous artists and practitioners emphasize native dance as a spiritual practice. For this decolonial possibility, I purposefully enact ethnographic refusal by not providing an explicit example of native dances as a spiritual practice, although there are many. As Alex Zahara writes, quote, Ethnographic refusal is a practice by which researchers and research participants together decide not to make particular information available for use within the academy. Its purpose is not to bury information, but to ensure that communities are able to respond to issues on their own terms. Because many Native people view indigenous dance as sacred knowledge, they may regard writing about such practices as controversial, if not also disrespectful. 
Additionally, writing about these practices may unwittingly contribute to cultural appropriation, since there are long histories of non-native choreographers, such as Ruth St. Dennis, Ted Sean, and Martha Graham, who appropriated indigenous dance. Decolonial possibility number two is resistance. The theme of resistance is implicit in contemporary practices given native dance has defied and continues to defy native assimilation and conversion policies. The ghost dance, which is pictured here, is prominently interconnected to more than human well-being, and it perhaps provides the most well-known example. Yet native dance does not always express resistance in such overt ways. Like movement modes, dance is a fluid practice, which can be analyzed in various and even contradictory ways. This mutable quality makes dance well-suited to subversively convey resistance. For instance, in the 19th and 20th century, some indigenous people elected to perform in Wild West shows, which were endeavors often run by non-native people. Although indigenous performers' participation in Wild West shows could be re uh, viewed as reifying settler colonialism due to stereotypical depictions of native people, it also allowed them to perpetuate and innovate their life ways at a time when native dance was legally prohibited. Moreover, the indigenous actors in the Wild West shows at times reenacted battles, which depicted them in conflict with European American performers. These battles could be viewed as a native demonstration of indigenous sovereignty and resistance to colonization and assimilation. Decolonial possibility number three is dancing sovereignty. Indigenous resistance is further enacted in expressions of sovereignty in dance, which also demonstrate how different characteristics of native dance intersect and overlap. Some scholars in indigenous studies discuss native legal so sovereignty as separate from visual sovereignty, which scholar Dr. Mikey L. Dangeli, um, she's created the concept of dancing sovereignty to show how the legal and visual interlock. Dr. Dangeli defines dancing sovereignty as, quote, self-determination carried out through the creation of performances oratory, songs, and dances that adhere to and expand protocols in ways that affirm hereditary privileges, ancestral histories, and associated ownership of songs, dances, crests, masks, headdresses, etc., and territorial rights to land and waterways among diverse audiences and collaborators." Unquote. As Dr. D'Angeli clarifies, and this um, that's her dancing right there in the um, front of the photograph. Indigenous sovereignty as enacted through dance interconnects with more than humans. Considering assimilation policies have attempted to undermine native self-determination, simply connecting to one's native identity through dance can be a way of enacting sovereignty. Decolonial possibility number four, relationships, community, and native nation building. Indigenous dance can nurture respectful and reciprocal human to human and human to more than human relationships in the past, present, and future, which the imposition of colonization and Eurocentric frameworks has often undermined. For some indigenous people, more than human relatives also constitute nations. For example, the Buffalo Nation. There are a multitude of examples of how native dance on stage and off can promote positive interdependencies. These interconnections are made visible through movement qualities which mimic more than humans. Dance regalia which can be fashioned from more than humans and procured according to indigenous protocols that enact more than human sustainability and the process of preparing for and enacting the dances and ceremonies. Decolonial possibility number five is healing and hope. Native dances can offer healing and hope. 
countering the detrimental impacts of settler colonialism on the holistic health of Native humans and more than humans. In Native movement practices, the refrain, movement as medicine, is well recognized. For example, the jingle dress dance, and this is a, an, uh, a depiction of Native young women doing the jingle dress dance, and those are the jingles on their dress. Um, the jingle dress dance emerged during the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919. Native practitioners traced the healing capacities of this dance to the color of the dancers' dresses and ribbons, as well as to the sound of the jingles. The rhythmic pattern resembles the rustling of tree leaves and the vibration of the northern lights, amplifying how more than human connections can heal human sickness. Another possibility is well-being and joy. Native dance, like dancing in general, can promote well-being and joy. Since Native bodies, identities, and dances interconnect with Native lands and more than humans, Indigenous human well-being and joy can be implicitly linked with that of more than humans. Recent studies have shown that Native people accrue health benefits by engaging in their cultural practices. In the jingle dress dance, healing frequently implies sickness or in, main, um, in mainstream discourses, trauma. Well-being infers the maintenance of good health and native well-being can challenge systemic structures that disproportionately and detrimentally affect the holistic health of indigenous people. Likewise, native joy defies the settler colonial stereotype of the sad and stoic Indian. Movement connects to joy by producing endorphins, which, quote, interact with the receptors in the brain that produce perceptions of pain and trigger a positive feeling in the body, similar to that of morphine, often described as euphoric, unquote. Finally, um, this last slide, that's me with my daughters, who through their father are enroll, uh, will be enrolled Cheyenne River Sioux. Um, and this final possibility is indigenous presence, innovation, and futurity. So indigenous dance, which again is interlocking with the land and more than humans, can communicate indigenous presence, innovation, and futurity. Live in-person performances, which feature native people dancing, can illuminate their enduring and embodied presences. Indigenous dance can also help make apparent native spaces. This includes rendering visible settings, which settler colonial discourses often do not associate with indigenous peoples, such as showing Denver and other urban landscapes as native lands. In their performance, native dancers may also utilize attire, props, and music which can further contribute to audiences' understandings of Native people as modern and dynamic. Indigenous innovations in dance, a form of futurity, can occur in a multitude of ways. Native people can innovate their tribal and pan-tribal dances, dances through varying their movement qualities or regalia. They can also fuse Native understandings or dance practices with other movement forms such as yoga, which emerge from different socio-political contexts. Although yoga has indigenous roots, Native people can also indigenize movement practices which are frequently considered to have non-Native origins, such as hip hop or skateboarding. So to conclude this part, um, this lecture, for the reasons that I have outlined, Native dance can be considered an exemplary decolonial practice, yet pa past and present in de jure and de facto ways, U.S. policies and practices have constructed obstacles that inhibit and outright prohibit indigenous people from engaging in their movement practices, which again are inseparable from bodies, lands, and more than humans. In the contemporary day, government agencies have destroyed sacred sites, disrupted tribal ceremonies, and prevented Native people from legally harvesting Native plants. While there is no single approach to promote Indigenous futurities, 
I advocate for centering indigenous experts and their work and supporting the land back movement, which consists of returning land to indigenous peoples so that they can restore their relationships with the land and other more than humans. I'd like to transition now to the second part of this lecture, which is a workshop on North American hand talk. This workshop will discuss the international and decolonial possibilities of this signed language and offer an indigenous land acknowledgement, which I will also explain and we can sign together. Again, North American hand talk is the lingua franca or common language of North America. Because of the Eurocentric construct of Cartesian dualism, which misrepresents signed language as inferior to spoken language, people sometimes assume that only native people who have disabilities use North American hand talk. While it is true that native people who are deaf have been some of the leading experts on and signers of North American hand talk, it is not the case that only native people who are deaf have used sign language. Indeed, native people have often used North American hand talk while they're speaking. Further, like native dance, North American hand talk serves inter-tribal and intra-tribal purposes. For example, indigenous people from diverse nations have employed hand talk to communicate with one another when they did not share a common spoken language, such as for the purposes of international diplomacy or trade. Regarding intra-tribal purposes, sign language also allows people to communicate and silence when doing so is strategic or necessary, such as during warfare. Native people have also used North American hand talk to communicate across long distances without shouting. In some tribes, mothers would sign to their children who were playing far away on the plains rather than calling out to them. Finally, North American hand talk, like other forms of sign language, can cultivate inclusivity. Elders who are hard of hearing may benefit from seeing someone sign while they speak. Babies who are often able to communicate before they have the verbal capabilities to do so, um, babies are often able to communicate before they have the verbal capabilities to do so, which is why to this day some people advocate for teaching young children sign language. So to further contextualize the history and politics of North American hand talk, and its relationship to dance, I want to show um, the silent film Buffalo Dance. Shot on December 24, 1984, in Thomas Edison's Black Maria studio, um, Buffalo Dance features the Lakota dances, dancers' last horse, parts his hair, and hair coat, and is one of the first films to depict Native people. So what I'm showing you here are advertisements from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Um, which they were involved with. The Lakota performers in Buffalo Dance were actors in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show who had stopped into the studio in West Orange, New Jersey while touring Brooklyn. Although many scholars have written about the important film Buffalo Dance, they have often overlooked that the dancers choreographed their performance to each offer a sign in North American hand talk. Scholars have often assumed that the film shows a buffalo dance. In fact, it's an Omaha dance. I know this because I spoke with Deacon Ben Black Bear, a highly respected elder, renowned for his knowledge of the Lakota language and culture, and a performer from a well-known dance family. The name of the film, Buffalo Dance, may function as a form of advertising, promoting Buffalo Bill's brand. In translating the North American hand talk for this film, I relied on the expertise of Dr. Lanny Realbird, who is Crow, a North American hand talk expert who has dedicated over two decades to revitalizing native signed and spoken languages. Let's watch the film together now and pay attention to this first performer. Unfortunately, it is not clear who each of the dancers is, so I cannot refer to them by name. And by the way, this film, while we're putting it up here, is also available open access through the Library of Congress on YouTube. So 
So the per first performer we're looking at is in the back. He's circling around. You can see him. He'll do it once more, pointing down with his finger and wiggling his other digits behind, so like this. The first answer communicates indomitability and ongoing Lakota warrior prowess, which has been inseparable from Lakota physical and cultural survival. Circling toward the camera, he crouches lower and looks in the direction of his left index finger, which points to the ground as he wiggles his other digits. The dancer indicates that he and other, others are tracking something, perhaps a human enemy or more than human, human animal. Okay, and now we'll take a look at the second dancer. And he's the one in the middle, uh, right here, standing. And he brings his hand, as you can see, across his throat like this. The second dancer directly addresses the camera, connoting the past, and the past and persistent threat of Lakota sovereignty. Like the first dancer, he holds a stick. Dancing in a grappler stance, the performer transitions from a low, crouched position with a deep bend in his knees to a more upright posture. As he circles somewhat behind the first dancer, his left arm angles like a chicken wing. With his hand at his waist, he appears to reach for something perhaps the small knife or a blade, but the object remains indistinguishable. As the dancer moves to the middle of the frame, taking center amid the other circling performers, he takes his left hand to the right side of his neck and draws it across before momentarily making eye contact with the camera, which is the sign for cutthroat and Lakota. By the way, usually hand talk is done with the right hand, but they're holding their weapons in the right hand, so they're signing with their left. According to Fred Malone Hahn, Sioux, an outsider term for Lakota people, means cutthroat. Taken together, the first and second dancer signs indicate that Lakota power, while enduring, here remains focused on tracking an enemy or prey. Because Sioux is an outsider term for Lakota people, this sign could also indicate the dancer's decolonial reappropriation of this disparaging term. And then finally, let's focus on the third dancer. It's him right there, and he's going to circle all the way around. Well, this, so, so his, move, his uh, hand talk is this, and then he has his tomahawk in this hand. While the second dancer is still finishing signing cutthroat, the third performer swiftly and skillfully steps towards the camera. The third dancer then stares directly at the viewer and elevates his chest, seemingly growing in height. According to Dr. Lanny Realbird, this dancer communicates, I will kill him through North American hand talk and martial movements. The dancer forms a loose fist with his left hand and brings it across his body to his right collarbone, which he thumps three times, a sign for eye, while holding an intense gaze. The hand talk signs that the dancer employs demonstrate a clear attempt to maintain autonomy over their own practice, as if they knew that viewers, such as us, would watch their performance out of context. Last horse parts his hair and hair coats use of North American hand talks shows that they may have adapted their dance for cinematic audiences to convey dialogue and contextualize their performance, much like title cards, the title cards for silent films. A convention of silent film title cards have two types, dialogue and expository titles, which also serve the same purposes as the dancer's use of North American hand talk. However, title cards were not invented until 1902, nearly a decade after Buffalo Dance was filmed. Indeed, as Dr. Lanny Realbird told me, the dancers didn't have captions, so they signed. Cinematic histories have yet to recognize the Lakota dancers' important intervention. And I think also what this film makes clear is that although Native people and practices are often stereotyped as being in the past or extinct, um, in contrast, needed people and practices have always been at the forefront of technology and innovation. I'm just waiting um, for my slide. 
but it, it uh, just says Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. So to conclude this presentation, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement in North American Hand Talk and teach it to you. Regarding land acknowledgements, Harmeet Kaur writes, quote, while indigenous people have practiced land acknowledgements for generations, Westerners have adopted the custom relatively recently as they attempt to reckon with the harms brought on by colonization. Land acknowledgements are now routine in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, and are becoming increasingly prevalent in progressive spaces in the US, unquote. At least several US universities, research centers, departments, and or programs have recently adopted indigenous land acknowledgements. In academic settings, land acknowledgements are often given prior to an event and or may circulate on written materials such as event programs, syllabi, letterhead, departmental and center websites, and email signatures. These statements typically identify the original indigenous people whose lands the university currently occupies and ideally should be created in collaboration from indigenous leaders from the tribe or tribes who have often cared for that area since time immemorial. This is because ultimately land acknowledgements should not be an empty performance, but rooted in reciprocal and respectful relationship building with indigenous peoples. Universities sometimes invite indigenous leaders to give land acknowledgements prior to events as well and may read should compensate them with their honoraria for their expertise, time, and travel. Indigenous land acknowledgements can be important because they directly combat the injustice of settler capitalist mainstream discourses which often obscure indigenous people and relegate them to a historical past. In other words, by bringing visibility to indigenous people in the present day, indigenous land acknowledgements can be a critical first step towards decolonization. I know today that many of us are coming from different places from around the world, so the land acknowledgement that I'm offering today is more general. I encourage you to learn about indigenous people whose lands you benefit from working and living on and how you might support their efforts towards decolonization. I also offer this land acknowledgement acutely aware of the violence indigenous people are facing all over the world. Okay, so if you wanna stand with me, I'll show you how to do this. So this sign, testing, okay. So this sign is for I, you just bring your hand like this. I am grateful to be here. This is also the sign for sit on and then indigenous is if you have a feather, an eagle feather, is a sacred form of community honoring. And then land, you take your hands down and then extend them out, down towards the earth and out. Indigenous, land, and then sacred. This, you're going to take a peace sign and then spiral it upward. This is also the sign for medicine. Indigenous, and this is the sign for dance, dance is sacred. Indigenous people are sacred. And then I have written up here all over the world. We're gonna do all land, so all, all and then land. Good, okay, you think we could do that one more time together? There's a, I, I put a lot of repetition to make it easier for us. Okay, so indigenous, our indigenous land acknowledgement. I'm grateful to be here on indigenous land. Indigenous land is sacred. Indigenous dance is sacred. Indigenous people are sacred all over the world. Thank you. So we covered, we covered a lot of ground today. 
And um, we have about 14 minutes left, and I'm happy to answer any questions or if you have any comments or feedback, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes. Oh, thanks, Alicia. Sorry. Yeah. Hi there. So I was recently in Canada, in northern Saskatchewan, uh, was a very, very large indigenous population. And the hoop dance is very, very popular there. And I'm just curious, unless I missed something, if the hoop dance fits into any of this. Thank you. Yes, that's a really good question. And it does. I almost included an image of the hoop dance. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the hoop dance, uh, people, when, when they're dancing, Native practitioners, they often have several hoops. And during the dance, they can arrange the hoops into all sorts of different shapes. Often the, the shapes are symbolizing more than humans and different animals. Um, and this, uh, this, this dance has ceremonial origins, like the hoop has a lot of um, uh, sacred meanings for Native people from all different tribes. And um, it's also now, in the 1930s, it gained um, popularity as well. And um, yeah, you see, it, you see it at powwows, you see it at Native gatherings. And so, yeah, I definitely, I've written about that dance, and I think it's also, it fits in with the overall um, framework that I've developed here. Um, it's interesting too, one thing I'll note is a lot of my work is in collaboration with uh, Native people who are um, incarcerated because my book project looks at um, Native dance and movement practices in contexts of confinement such as former Indian boarding schools. If you're unfamiliar with that, um, in the late 1800s the U.S. Um, created Indian boarding schools where they forcibly removed Native people from their families and communities, sometimes for years at a time. They cut their hair, they prevented them from speaking their Native languages. This is why we see that a lot of, there's a lot of efforts around, um, you know, cultural and language revitalization. Um, but I say all that to say that the, this, I, I often don't like talk about dance in kind of this overall broad way um, but I was encouraged to do so by my friend's colleague and collaborator, George Bluebird, who's Oglala Lakota and has been locked up at the South Dakota State Penitentiary for over 40 years now. And what he, I originally gave um, this talk as a keynote at the powwow that occurs at the prison at the South Dakota State Penitentiary. And what he said to me is, I want you to, um, to speak about why Native dance is important to the, to the Native men who are incarcerated here. And so this, um, this, this, this uh, presentation, and it's also gonna be a published paper, comes out of my work for him and was really, his, um, his directions for what I should say at the powwow were really, uh, was the imp impetus for thinking about dance in this way. And actually I think it's very useful to communicating to people who are not that familiar with Native peoples or practices or dance, what dance does and why it's so, what Native dance does and why it's so important and connected to so many um, other, other things. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Fabulous presentation, thank you. I have a quick comment and then I wanna ask a question. We have two Fulbrights, two, that have been appointed who are Native American, indigenous. And one of them is a colleague of mine. She's a member of the Pamunkey tribe in Virginia. She was hired during the filming of Pocahontas if she, to see if she could offer comments and advice. And when she commented to the filmmakers, it was being filmed in Jamestown, that it might be prudent to hire, have an indigenous person actually portray Pocahontas, she was, um, to put it politely, sidelined. So my question is, um, what is the status of conversations to arrive at a more universal, inclusive terminology for all of the native, you know, 500 plus tribes? Because I think that's an important consideration, especially for those of us who are not natives, 
to appreciate and to understand the culture. Yes, so you're asking about the, like what collective terms are appropriate. Um, yes, that's a great question. So uh, Native American is very acceptable, uh, indigenous, Native peoples, we usually use the S because one of the stereotypes of Native peoples is that they're commonly represented as a monolith, that they're, they're all the same, which of course is not true. American Indian is also acceptable. A lot of times people um, say Indian is more of an outsider term, so it's not something that I, I really ever use or I would use in speaking with academic audiences. But where you do see that term a lot and people use that term a lot is in the law school, right? Because there's Indian law, Indian policy. So that comes up more there, um, but not really a term I use. Um, many Native people, you're, you're talking about the collective, um, but also I think it would be good to underscore that many Native people also prefer their tribally specific name for themselves, right? So like Navajo is an outsider term for Diné. That's what, what they call themselves. Or the same thing with, um, with a Sioux, right? I was talking about how that could be considered a disparaging term and people today not always, but often prefer uh, Lakota, or they prefer, um, you know, even uh, 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 their their band or um, the federally recognized tribe that they're affiliated with, such as Cheyenne River Sioux or um, you know Oglala Lakota, Oglala Sioux, Oglala Lakota, right? So. Um, People do prefer, if you're not talking about the collective usually, to talk um, their, their, their tribal names for themselves, what they call themselves. And that often translates, like if you were to translate to that as the people, they call themselves the people. The human beings. Yes. Question, I've, oh, I've spent some time at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. It seems to me, if I remember right, the ghost dance was used as an excuse by the military to start that slaughter up there. Is that true? Is that your understanding of that event? It definitely, it, it definitely played a part of that. Often what is associated with uh, the ghost dance is uh, the um, Wounded Knee Massacre in which the government um, uh, killed, the U.S. Calvary killed, 300 um, children, women, and men. So yes, that's often associated with the ghost dance. Um, the, the ghost dance actually associated, uh, it, it was a pan-tribal movement, and um, you know, California tribes were even involved in this movement. Wavoka was the Paiute prophet who uh, really originated the ghost dance, and it was his vision. And there's a really good book, um, by Nick Estes, a recent book. He's, uh, he's Lakota, I believe, from Pine Ridge, called Our History is the Future. And one thing he really highlights in that book is that um, the ghost dance, it, it was a vision. It is, it is a vision, and that vision endures in a lot of the um, ongoing uh, movements that Native people are involved in um, towards decolonization and social justice. I had a question, but I changed my mind as we went along. I have a different question. Since Native communities are sovereign nations, what would you think about the possibility of having Fulbright scholars assigned to sovereign nations? I mean, I think that would be so amazing <laughs> if that came out of that. And it would be such a powerful opportunity for you know, people, people to learn about one another. So yes, I think that, that's a wonderful idea. I would love to see that happen. Great comment, question. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the history of the hand talk? Particularly, uh, I'm fascinated by the idea that it was used as the lingua franca across uh, native languages and tribes, that they would, if they were traveling, um, they would be able to communicate with each other. Do you know anything about its development or its history? It seems an amazing feature of the culture. 
Yeah, I mean, beyond sort of what I shared, I mean, that would have been, you know, its development or its origins would have been like so long ago, right? So um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not really, I don't really know much more about that, but um, I guess, Uh, one thing I should highlight too is that it's often it's often been referred to as Plains Indian Sign Language, and it's been more recently that people have moved away from it and referred to it as Indigenous Sign Language or Hand Talk because they now recognize the reason it was I think called Plains Indian Sign Language is, is because it, it was well documented by non-native anthropologists among Plains Indian people, but. People have now even created maps and show how it was used throughout, you know, throughout Tur Turtle Island and throughout um, Canada, the U.S., and also Mexico. And and, and I and I think you know it it, it uh, you know is when people didn't have a sh uh, when it was exchanged between tribes, it was often because people didn't have um, a shared common language. Um, but also it was used, of course, like within the tribe and had many um, benefits in that way as well. And, and the final thing I'll say about that is some, um, some people have also, Makablu Wakpa has written about um, the ways that it has a lot of potential, hand talk has a lot of potential to be used in sp indigenous spoken language revitalization. And the reason for that is because it creates a full language immersion experience. So, so as you could see, like a lot of the signs, you know, they're not complicated. You could remember them pretty easily. So then if you don't necessarily have the spoken word, instead of reverting to English, then you can um, use a sign. We have time for one last question. Oh, and you know what? One more thing about the development that's interesting is a lot of times the sign language is um, very similar to pictographs or like um, to, to, the, to the writing, you know, on, on walls or things like that, right? So like the, the hand talk for lightning looks like this, but that's also how you would, you know, draw it or paint it, right? So there's similarities between that as well. Um, you were talking about how Westerners have documented the Indian, I mean, Native American hand talk. So I was wondering if you had an opinion about the history of Western anthropologists and their analysis of the natives, and then like a writer or a book about decolonizing methodologies or somebody that would, you know, I know there's tons of stuff out there, but if you have a recommendation about somebody like me that would like to really understand what's cutting edge, what's worthwhile, what we should go with if we want to become more informed, maybe about the history, but also what's really good going on now. Yes, it's a, it's a really good question. So, so now in academia, we recognize the ways that people have historically done academic research can be violent and problematic in terms of not, you know, people who are not from that community going into that community and extracting knowledge, exploiting people, and, ne and often not ever reporting back to them, right? And so there has been a whole movement, as you said, around decolonizing methodology. There's a Maori scholar, Linda Smith, who, um, who, who, whose book is titled Decolonizing Methodologies, and she has various um, decolonial, decolonial projects that people might consider. Um, I think one way that I really um, implement this in my work is through doing community-engaged research, right? So instead of coming to Native or Indigenous people with your own project, what you might um, you might think is is a good idea is talking with them having conversations with them and seeing how can we be useful to you and how can this our work together be respectful and be reciprocal and how can it have mutual benefits and i also have um 
another aspect of this too is you know, the way that academic journals, you often have to have a university affiliation in order to access them, right? Um, but I have a co-written, I, I, I do community engaged work as well with people, who, Lakota people who are incarcerated, but also the California native Tongva people whose lands um, that UCLA currently occupies. And so I have a co-written article, um, Performativity, Possibility, and Land Acknowledgement. Um, the first writer is a graduate student a uh, graduate student researcher I've worked with um, for a number of quarters and years at this point, and thinking about how to bring Native people into our, our research and our teaching in respectful and reciprocal ways. Oh, and the reason I brought up open access journals is because you can find that on, I put all my articles up there, so you can find that open access um, on my academia.edu site, Down, just download it. Thank you so much, Tria, for your amazing presentation. Let's give her another round of applause for her amazing presentation.